for a load of iron ore. The five-day round trip began at the Fort Rouge complex outside Detroit. Moving through the Rouge River to the Detroit River, the Benson headed north through Lake St. Clair and the St. Clair River. She steamed the full length of Lake Huron and then made her way through the St. Mary's River and the Sioux Locks. She sailed halfway across Lake Superior to the port of Marquette, and once loaded with ore, she retraced her route. Hello, I'm Mort Krim. For some time now, the American world of work has echoed with fevered talk of corporate takeovers, massive layoffs, closed down factories, the rise of high tech, and a glut of low paying service jobs. Because hazard and chance continue to dominate today's rapidly changing workplace, this new documentary series exploring the working lives of American men and women is called Risky Business. We launched the series tonight with a close-up look at the changing world of Great Lakes shipping. And if you've ever gazed at one of those huge lake freighters and wondered what it might be like on board, tonight we can promise you a very special treat. <laughs> And don't forget to leave your cables out, starboard. You never know what one of these steamboats are going to do. You know, you think you may have an idea what it's going to do, and this old gal wants to go her way. Uh, you just have to wait and see what she wants to do. A veteran of more than 40 years on the lakes, Captain Pat Owen's first chore on leaving the Rouge is to back his 767-footer very slowly into a turning basin that's only 900 feet wide. So how does he move her sideways, away from the dock? Right now I'm working the stern thruster. That's a tube that's back aft, and it's right on the bottom, just above the keel. And it's just a tunnel with a propeller in there, and we can force water from one side to the other, and it does the same thing as if you had a tug back there. Once in the turning basin, the captain uses both stern and bow thrusters to turn this massive ship almost completely around. With so little room to spare, he relies on his mates, posted at the boat's bow and stern, to see how many feet he has in front and back. Ready on the swing off the salt dock. Okay. I need that mate forward. He spots off anywhere from 12 to 20 feet. We try to go by forward. And then that leaves us 50 or 60 feet over the stern. The boat's swing offers a panoramic view of the Rouge complex. Conceived by Henry Ford when he bought the site 75 years ago as the world's largest self-contained car manufacturing complex. The idea was to do everything in one place, from the processing of raw materials to final assembly. Ironically, the first thing produced at the new assembly plant was a boat. Near the end of World War I, Ford built submarine chasers called Eagle Boats for the Navy. Old Henry's fleet of Ford freighters hauled iron ore and other materials from the northern reaches of Michigan and Minnesota. Until this spring, the Benson Ford was one of three freighters operated by Ford Steel Division, playing a vital role in keeping 16,000 Rouge workers on the job. Okay. As the Benson noses through the first of six bridges over the Rouge River, Captain Owens works closely with his wheelsmen and again relies on his mates to tell him how he's doing. Negotiating the Rouge and its narrow bridges is one of the captain's most demanding chores. You only get one chance, you know. I was on the Henry in uh, 83. We come up against one of them bridge abutments over here on Fort Street. It cost Ford Motor Company a quarter of a million dollars to fix it. But while the captain has a lot of help, he takes full responsibility for a vessel worth $25 million. If anything happens, the first thing they want to know, the first one they're going to come to is me. But what happens if a bridge doesn't open on time? It's hard to explain how long it takes us both to stop. And if you back a vessel half speed or full speed, you can't control the bow. And in the river, you have no place for that bow to swing. I'm still a deckhand, and uh, what I do is I, I tie up the boat, we chip, we paint the boat maintenance. The son of a British seaman, Harry Castle, grew up in New York, got his seaman's papers and sailed for years on saltwater ships. Saltwater is like a paid vacation. You get to go to all these here countries and souvenirs and stuff like that, and you come back broke. No overtime or anything like that. On the lakes you work, you work hard. You can make a few dollars. Working basically nine to five, seven days a week for months at a time, a deckhand like Harry will also log a great deal of overtime whenever the boat is docking, loading, or unloading. And he can make more than $50,000 in an eight-month season. 
We put in a lot of hours. But last month, I think I put 37 hours straight. We got a train on the Conrail. For Captain Owens, one of the touchy moments on this trip out of the Rouge came when he spotted a freight train on the Conrail Bridge spanning the river ahead. A few minutes later, as the Benson passed an ocean-going freighter being loaded with scrap metal for delivery in Europe, the train was still on the bridge. Hello, Conrail, the Benson Ford. Yeah, what's the matter with that train? Or is he, uh, he isn't on the bridge. You can open it, eh? But he don't have no air? Roger, he's uh, pumping him up right now. He should be on the move shortly. He picked a poor place to pump him up. Okay, get her up as soon as you can. She's windier than hell, and I'm coming. Roger, Captain. You might be out of a job. Minutes later, the Benson was moving closer to the bridge with the train still on it, and the captain was still unhappy at the prospect of having to slow or stop his boat in the river. Come on, hit them bells. There she goes, there she goes. With the train off, the bell sounded and the bridge opened. But several minutes later, as the Benson headed through the final bridge over the Rouge, the wind, which had kicked up in the river, caused Captain Owens more anxious moments. Okay, put her hard left. For running in and out of the Rouge, the wind is the worst thing for us. Sometimes you'll have the wheel hard over and running the bow thruster on certain stretches, just so you can stop the drift. Finally, after nearly scraping the last bridge with her stern, and after more than an hour of navigating the Rouge, the Benson headed into the brisk, deep current of the Detroit River. Just downriver from here was the old shipbuilding yard at the Great Lakes Engineering Works. Detroit remained a shipbuilding center until some 30 years ago, when the last freighter was built at Great Lakes. And this boat was the largest ever constructed to that time. In June 1958, thousands watched as the 729-foot ore carrier Edmund Fitzgerald slipped into a basin barely large enough to hold her. A flawless launch for what many considered the finest example of the shipbuilder's art. But the occasion was marred when a Toledo man was stricken with a heart attack and died at the scene. More than one old salt cursed the ship's luck, recalling the sailor's ancient superstition that any unfortunate occurrence during a boat's launch was always a bad omen. In the middle of Detroit's broad river, Captain Owens could relax a bit, but not for long. Before heading north, the Benson had to stop and load up at the Sterling fuel dock, just up a ways on the Canadian side. Midship. Midship. The Sterling fuel dock to me is, uh, for me, it's the hardest dock I have to make. Because one time, the current will set you right into the dock. The next time, you can't you never seem to get the boat air up air against air the dock. Yeah, okay, I got a back or that wind's sho shoving her right up the creek. It, it isn't turning in the driveway and hitting the button and watch the garage door go. You know how you'd feel if you went in the garage door roaring and put your foot on the floor and the uh, brakes didn't work. This time, with help again from his wheelsmen and mates, things go smoothly for the captain. How's that? Beautiful, Captain. Beautiful. We got about six feet to spot. Okay, you guys got her. Roger, roger that. One foot out. Yeah, that's 442, arrive at the fuel dock. Yeah, like that. Yeah, I'm originally from uh, the East Coast, Little Island off of Cape Cod, Massachusetts, called Nantucket. I grew up around boats most of my life. When I graduated from high school, I went to the Maine Maritime Academy, and that's where I picked up the initial training for what I do now. First assistant engineer, Henry Terry, is in charge of loading 50,000 gallons of fuel. The fuel is called the number six crude. If you were to look at it on the shelf, it would look like molasses. Fueled up and underway again, the Benson Ford steamed under that giant link between Canada and the United States, the Ambassador Bridge. It was built in 1929, after earlier plans for a railroad drawbridge had been stymied by powerful shipping interests. From the very beginning, Great Lakes shipping had a tremendous influence on the history and development of the great port cities of Buffalo, Cleveland, Chicago, and Detroit. From the earliest canoes to the steam-driven freighters that came later, shipping on the lakes has played a vital role in the economic life of the entire region. 
During those expansive days of the 19th century, large quantities of raw materials such as lumber, iron, stone, and coal were moved efficiently on the lakes to build the cities and towns of a booming Midwest. Vital commodities and products such as grain, meat, hardware, and machinery were transported as well. At the Dawson Great Lakes Museum on Detroit's Belle Isle, much of this history is preserved and documented with artifacts, models, and exhibits. More than 1,700 schooners sailed the Great Lakes from 1870 to 1900, but they were gradually replaced by much larger freighters with iron instead of wood hulls and powered by steam engines instead of wind and sail. As the Benson headed into Lake St. Clair, she encountered this modern example of Great Lakes shipbuilding technology, the massive $60 million supercarrier George A. Stenson. 1,004 feet long, 105 feet wide, she was downbound with 60,000 tons of iron ore pellets, nearly two and a half times what the Benson can carry. The captain of the Stenson had worked in years past as a mate on the Benson, and as the two ships passed, he stepped out to greet an old friend. One of more than a dozen thousand footers working the lakes today, the Stenson is the most ingenious way ever devised by man to move huge bulk cargoes over long distances. Once in Lake St. Clair, Pat Owens could relax a bit in the captain's suite. I'm third generation. My grandfather was the chief engineer. My dad was the chief engineer, and I started in 1945 between 11th and 12th grade in school. Being uh, born and raised in Marine City, and at that time it was a sailor town. When I first went to work for Interlake Steamship Company, I think there was, oh, maybe 14, 16 chief engineers. There was six skippers from Marine City, just in Interlake Steamship Company alone. With the industry at its peak, Pat Owens moved up quickly from deckhand to watchman to wheelsman. And after 10 years with Interlake, minus a three-year stint in the service, he passed the test for a pilot's license and made third mate. But in the early 60s, Interlake cut back its fleet, and Pat Owens left to join Ford. Over the next 20 years, he moved from third to first mate and passed the master's exam. But with younger men at the helm in a small Ford fleet, it wasn't until 1986 that he finally made captain. Today, Pat Owens makes more than $90,000 a year. He says the money has always been good. But when I was with Interlake, uh, I think if, if I could have found a decent job ashore, I think I would have left because I was away from home so much. You know, we would leave uh, in the spring of the year. There was no vacations. And you, le you left in uh, the first week in April or the last week in March, and you never got home again until December. The captain and his wife have five children, the youngest a son who's 17. After this trip, the captain will take two weeks off to watch him play high school football. Pat knows his wife's role has often been lonely and difficult, but says she's never asked him to quit. Before uh, we were married, I was sailing, and we went together for a couple of years, and she knew what it was like. So there was, there's no problem. Uh, she knew what the loneliness would be. Two hours later, darkness enveloped the Benson as she steamed up the St. Clair River past the town of the same name. Navigating the river at night became less chancy with the advent of the radar scanner. That narrow, light-colored blip at the screen center marked a downbound freighter the Benson was about to pass. Only her lights were visible in a quiet night that gave no hint of what the Benson would face just a few hours to the north in the wild winds of Lake Huron. Risky Business, Iron Boat, Iron Men is brought to you by the Michigan Travel Bureau. Celebrate the Great Lakes by Manufacturers Bank, Bank or Business Banks, and by Citibank, MasterCard, and Visa. Manufacturers Bank has helped begin a lot of beginnings. We helped Ford keep the line rolling. Sears has been counting on us for almost 50 years. We've always provided expert financial services for businesses, as well as for families just getting off the ground. We think there's still a lot of ground to be broken. Bank, where business banks, manufacturers bank. I am Michigan. I am endless coastlines. 
and deep forests sheltering life. I am towering cliffs guarding the Great Lakes. And miles of wind-gathered sand. I am rivers that roll and sometimes fall. I am green meadows and elegant places. I am Michigan. Yes, Michigan, the Vincent Ford plowed through 35 mile an hour winds and six foot waves in the middle of Lake Huron. Captain Owens had asked to be wakened if the wind picked up during the night. The second mate came down and informed me that uh, the wind was up to velocity 35. So we put in more ballast. In all, the boat took on 4,000 tons of water as additional ballast for a deeper, smoother ride. Every time that that bow would have hit one of them waves, you would have felt a slap up forward. And then the boat works too much. The boat is 700 feet long. This boat bends in the middle. So by putting the water in her and putting her down in the water, it keeps some waves from coming under, underneath that bow and lifting that boat. And if the lake had continued to pound the Benson? You can crack a plate. The boat can, the boat can crack in two. You know. There has been some that uh, have gone down that. And then there's the fact that the Benson today is not the boat she was when originally designed and built. Well, it was built in 1952 for Cleveland Cliffs. The original name was the Edward B. Green. And when she came out new, she was 647 feet long. In 1975, they cut her in half and put 120 feet in the middle. That's something the captain always keeps in mind in rough weather. I don't think the boat acts the same as they did when they were originally designed. They're a lot more limber in the middle. The center of gravity with the full cargo is higher. She has a tendency to roll more. She's a little bit, what they say, tender. Most people would be familiar with, say, an automobile where you've got 100 or 200 horsepower. Here you've got 7,000 horsepower. First assistant engineer, Henry Terry, is in charge of all maintenance in the engine room. The ship has a 7,000 horsepower steam turbine. The way that works, uh, the boilers, we burn fuel, it heats the water, we generate steam. The steam goes through a set of nozzles into the turbine. When the steam hits the turbine blade, it turns, that comes down through a reduction gear into the shaft, and that's what turns the propeller. I used to be a radioman in the Navy, and uh, I come up here, they abolished all the radioman years ago, you know, up here. They call Frank Saunders country because he comes from Virginia. But after many years on ocean-going vessels, Frank got a job working on the lakes as an oiler. Each hour, I have to make my checks, assist the engineer, pump ballast, everything gets running, I have to watch. From the uh, flat, we can monitor all the boiler operations, temperatures, pressures. Right now, everything is pretty much at a steady state. Uh, we're steaming at a constant rate. Frequently during the summer months, the work in the engine room has to be done in heat that reaches 120 degrees. It doesn't let up. You start down that ladder, the heat just hits you. Then you sweat. Personally, I like the work. I like the uh, being outdoors, good, healthy uh, environment most of the time. 
Born and raised in Trenton, Michigan, watchman Tim Whaley first tried working as a policeman, didn't care for it, and ended up on the lakes. I'd be lying to you if I told you I was never scared in a storm, but sure, that happens. The most famous storm, the one they call the King of Storms, swept the lakes with devastation in November 1913. What happened was so awful that Great Lakes experts like artist and historian Jim Clary still talk about it. There was a very confused sea, as, the, as the old skippers would call it. There was northwest, northeast changes of winds like this, and at 90 miles an hour or thereabouts, there was this cross-hatching of the sea, which, which made a very treacherous sea uh, for any vessel. With mountainous 30-foot waves and a blinding blizzard, the storm wreaked its worst havoc on Lake Huron. Clary and other marine artists have focused on two of the many boats caught up in the storm, the 524-foot ore carrier Charles Price and a 269-foot package freighter called the Regina. Well, there were eight major vessels lost on Lake Huron. The Charles Price was one that was uh, upside down for a number of days. Uh, they couldn't get out to it to determine because of the storm uh, which vessel it was. Uh, Thirteen crewmen from the Charles Price wound up dead on the shore with Regina life jackets on. Now, this has always been a mystery, but it would suppose that the uh, Charles Price was foundering, and along came the Regina and saw that she was in grave trouble, threw them in her life jackets, and then she went down herself later in, in the storm. Two years ago, divers found the Regina in 80 feet of water off Fort Sanilac, Michigan, and they've been bringing up her cargo ever since. Horseshoes, spoons, ladies' hand cream, and still preserved bottles of champagne and whiskey. In all, the storm sank, wrecked, or stranded some 40 vessels and took the lives of at least 235 sailors. As the Benson steamed through Thunder Bay off Alpena, she came upon a relic of another November storm, this one in 1966. The steel-laden German freighter Nordmere was headed for Chicago when her captain strayed too close to shore the boat was caught up on the rocky Thunder Bay Shoal. For nine days, captain and crew worked to get her free. But when a violent storm hit Lake Huron, they were forced to abandon ship, plucked from her deck by helicopter. That was the same storm that put an end to the 603-foot Daniel J. Morrell and all but one of her 29-man crew in Huron's south end. Conditions reminiscent of 1913 actually cracked the 60-year-old Morrell in two. And only the watchman miraculously survived 36 hours on a tiny raft as three of his crewmates froze to death. You have a couple of months in the early part of the season and then again in the late part of the season uh, where you get the rough weather, you can count on it. The deck freezes over and you have to go out with a club and beat the ice off around the clamps so you can get the hatch off. Uh, you're out there with hot water trying to melt the ice. Uh, and then you got to put up with the, the weather itself, the waves. I think they're more dangerous up here in uh, rough water than they are on the ocean. We take swells over the pilot house, waves come over the pilot house. Uh, I've never been anything real bad, but I don't want it either. The oceans, when they get rough, you know, you have the big swells, the big waves. Up here, they're, they're not as large, only they can get just as vicious or more so. These rare photos of an embattled lake freighter reinforce the findings of a scientific study conducted during the storm which sank the Daniel Morrell. Strain gauges installed on a freighter that survived recorded a stress of 23,000 pounds per square inch, much higher than ever recorded on any ocean vessel. In rough weather, when you walk the tunnels running the length of the Benson just below deck, you can actually see her bend and twist. With a stiff headwind and choppy seas, the Benson had lost an hour from her usual running time on Lake Huron. By the company's calculation, the boat produces $5,000 an hour for Rouge Steel. So an hour lost meant that much money lost. Nonetheless, by 4.30 Tuesday afternoon, the Benson had reached the north end of the lake and the St. Mary's River. To the right lay Drummond Island, and to the left, the town of Detour on the easternmost point of Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Weaving between numerous islands, the river is wide in some places, but so narrow in others that upbound traffic is restricted to one channel, while a different passage is designated for downbound vessels. Some five hours away were the famed Sioux Locks. Oh, you're always looking at the scenery. Yeah, I mean, you run the rivers for 
the millionth time or something like that. You know, I mean, you you still got to be naturally it's in the rivers. You're you're more alert, I suppose, you're on the lake, but uh, it does get to be a well-beaten trail. On his four to eight watch, first mate Scott Seaboy was at the helm for much of the run up the St. Mary's. He says he never tires of the chance to observe all kinds of life on the river. You know, you got the glasses. You're looking at this, looking at that. Who's building a new house? Uh, whose daughter's maturing and stuff like that, you know. <laughs> and at Stribling Point, there's always the top of a tall light pole to check out. Well, it's been there for years. It's a big bird nest. We thought at first they were eagles because that is a, an area frequented by eagles. But uh, we look at them since, well, we know they're not eagles. They're a big hawk anyway, and they apparently returned to that particular uh, range light. At sunset on the river, Captain Owens listened closely to radioed weather reports of gale warnings posted on Lake Superior for the night ahead. Well, gale warning is when we're going to get winds anywhere from 35 knots on up. And then when the winds get up to 45 knots, it's storm warning. But the captain also considered the sunset and the old sailor's belief that it meant fair weather to come. Red at night, sailor's delight. Finally, at 9.30, well after darkness had fallen, the Benson approached the locks at Sault Ste. Marie. Built to give boats a way around the impassable St. Mary's Rapids, the locks looked like this when they were first opened back in the 1870s. And this is how they looked in the 1960s in a film produced by the Detroit Public Schools and the Ford Motor Company. At the helm of the William Clay Ford, as she approached the locks, was none other than Pat Owens, now captain of the Benson Ford. But back then, third mate on the William Clay, and resplendent in the uniform then required of the boat's officers. With the help of the old-time lapse photography trick, the boat was raised 21 feet to the level of Lake Superior in only a matter of seconds. On the Benson, deckhands were swung over the side to help move the boat into the largest of four locks at the Sioux, 1,200 feet long and 110 feet wide. The technology of the locks hasn't changed much over the years. Once the Benson was secured in the lock with the upper gates closed, the lower gates were shut, sealing the boat in. The filling valve was then opened, and enough water to raise the vessel 21 feet was allowed to enter. Finally, with the filling process complete, the upper gate was opened, and the Benson moved slowly out of the lock and into the eastern end of the mighty Superior. More than a few on board wondered which would prove right, the old sailor's proverb or the forecaster's call for gale force wind. Some say there's a lot in the name. At Manufacturers Bank, we agree. Because over half a century of work with names like these has led to innovative banking for names like these. Get the advantage of banking where business banks. Manufacturers Bank. After midnight, you may be taking your life into your own hands on some stretches of suburban streets. The signs are all there. Swerving cars, slurring drivers. <laughs> Medallion, you got me. Too many bears. The sobering statistics. Nearly every other driver has been drinking. How are authorities keeping up? I am going to place you under arrest tonight. Four and why are these criminals able to walk away from the shattered lives they've left behind? Mike Wenland and the I-Team investigate Under the Influence, Tuesday on News 4 at 5. I am Michigan. Come and celebrate my Great Lakes. I took my family to California on vacation. I didn't need to carry a lot of cash because I, I taken along my Citibank visa. Then, in the middle of the trip, I lost it. So I called the 800 number from Citibank. I canceled his Citibank visa and immediately issued him a new one. She got the new car to my hotel within 24 hours. If it wasn't for Citibank, the kids would have missed this new land. Not just visa, Citibank visa. <laughs> Wednesday dawned clear and calm on Lake Superior. 
the largest, deepest, and coldest of the Great Lakes, Superior can change without warning, especially in the fall when Arctic winds sweep down to meet the lingering warmth of autumn air, producing sudden violent storms. According to Indian legend, it's a lake that never gives up its dead. And in fact, at 40 degrees, summer or winter, the lake is too cold for organisms that infest drowned bodies and raise them to the surface in warmer waters. Having steamed peacefully through the night across the eastern half of the huge lake, the Benson Ford was heading into the harbor at Marquette by 10 a.m. I've probably made that dock a dozen times as a skipper. It's the same thing, the wind and the current. Now there is current in that harbor, it's hard to believe. You wonder why there's current in there, but it must be just the circling of the water because if you're going to the south side of the dock, the current seems to set you on the dock. And if you're going to the north side, it'll set you away from the dock. Okay. You get the I operate the hatch crane that takes the hatches off so we can load the boat. Harry Castle says working on deck, you always have to keep your mind on the job. You can't take anything for granted no matter how long you've been doing it. You always have to approach that job like it's the first time. Something could happen just like that. Watchman Tim Whaley is proud of the Benson's good safety record. Everything on here is steel and everything can hurt you. One misstep and yeah, you can lose your life. You lose your life real quick. Like Whaley, wheelsman oh, Gary Archie is an AB or able-bodied seaman. You start out as a deckhand and you have to work 12 months and then you're qualified to write for an AB ticket to the Coast Guard. And if you pass a test, you're considered an AB and you can work as a watchman or a wheelsman. Yeah, okay, you can go ahead and land them. Land them out. The only way to get us off the boat is to swing us off and drop us down on the, on the dock so we can get the cables and stop the boat. When you first do it, uh, it's sort of like a thrill, you know, you like a fast elevator, you, you drop down, you know, but after a while you get used to it. I guess we're, we're, what we're called is uh, the root steel paratroopers or something like that. <laughs> after several more minutes of delicate and precise maneuvering, the huge boat was secure at the ancient ore dock at Press Eel outside Marquette. Okay, you guys got her. We got her. And only moments later, down came the first chute, and with it, the first of some 20,000 tons of iron ore pellets called taconite. Captain Owens was quickly off the boat and into town for a haircut and a visit with old friends, leaving the loading process to first mate Scott Seaboy. So the whole thing is just putting the ore in the right place in the boat so there's no strain on the ship and get to the proper uh, set of marks throughout. The boat is winched up and down the dock to get the right percentage of ore in each hatch in order to achieve the proper balance. And if it's not loaded correctly? Well, you get it out of whack sometime, and it, uh, it, it shows in the trip down the lake, for one thing. It's uh, got bad shake, you know, uh, abnormal shake, but it's got a, a list one way or the other. This is what the ore dock at Marquette looked like a hundred years ago. Then, as now, the loading process made good use of gravity. Rail cars were back onto the dock and their load dropped into holding bins. In the old days, though, their load was low-grade ore containing 36% iron and dug directly from the earth at the large Tilden Reserve, just south of Ishpeming in the Upper Peninsula. Back in the early 1970s, however, a new method was developed at the Tilden Mine in which the low-grade ore was crushed, powderized, and processed into pellets containing 65% iron. Today, only these taconite pellets are shipped, and thus the season is longer than it used to be. We never ran very late because they carried red ore, and that would freeze in the pockets. It's not like the pellets. And the pellets, you know, are just like marbles. They run, no moisture in them. On the Benson, loading had to be suspended for two hours, while all that additional water she took on in Lake Huron was pumped out to make room for more taconite. Many of the crew members took advantage of the lull to get off the boat for a while to visit with old friends or family or just to have some time to themselves. Third mate Barry Van took a walk in a nearby park. When we get to Detroit and we're unloading, if I have any time off, I shoot home for two to three hours, see the wife and family and, uh, and get back to the boat just before it sails. So at least I, I can get home at least once or twice a week, a couple hours, let them know dad's still around. Well, one of the toughest parts is probably being away from home, from your family. Like myself, we just had a baby girl three months ago, so 
coming home every every few every five days or so you watching her grow a lot of changes there by four in the afternoon the loading was completed the crew was back on board and the Benson Ford was on its way out of the harbor at Marquette and headed back across Superior. The hardy men who work on deck were soon battening down the hatches. Loading or unloading the taconite is the dirtiest part of each trip, with pellets scattered over the deck and a fine black dust over everything. Finally, it was time to clean up and have some dinner. Dinner time on the Benson Ford is 4.30 to 5.30 every afternoon. But Chief Cook, Jerry McCourt, says with crew members on many different shifts, the galleys never close. Actually, you got meal time 24 hours a day because of the fact that uh, they have different watches. At night, the galley's all open. They have a night lunch that they can help themselves anytime they want. For many years, Jerry was a chef at a restaurant in Detroit. But back in the early 70s, he found the pressure of the job too much and decided to try working the boats. Fourteen years later, he still likes the life. Well, you know what you're doing every day, and it's now a hustle and bustle, you know, a rat race, like it is on the beach. And you know exactly how much food to cook and how much to order. And uh, it works out real good. Unless you take vacation, there is no days off. This year, I worked all the way to August, and I took 15 days off. And now I'll go to the end of October, and I'll try and take the rest of the year off. Harry Castle says with a schedule like that, the quality of the food, good old-fashioned stick-to-the-ribs American fare, and the camaraderie of mealtime become very important. And with the hazards of working on deck, there's more reason to maintain friendships. My oldest brother told me, he says, when you get on a boat, he says, you make friends with everybody, because you never know what's going to happen, and uh, you might put your hand up for help, and the guy just laugh at you or walk away. So it's, it's best to be friends with everybody. The legend lives on from the Chippewa on down at the big lake they call Gitchagumi. The lake it is said never gives up her dead when the skies of November turn gloomy. At sunset, the Benson was only 20 miles from the spot where the Edmund Fitzgerald went down in that woeful storm which lashed Superior in November 1975. The freighter Arthur Anderson, some eight miles behind the Fitzgerald, tried to keep her lights in view and track her on radar. But at 7.25 p.m., in hurricane winds and 30-foot seas, she simply disappeared. In her day, the biggest and the proudest on the lakes, the favorite of buffs and shore watchers, she had seemed invincible. But it was as if a monstrous sea had grabbed her in its teeth, snapped her in two, and swallowed her forever, along with all of her 29 men. None of their bodies has ever been found. Today, she lies in two pieces on the bottom of Lake Superior in more than 500 feet of water. has been counting on us for almost 50 years. We've always provided expert financial services for businesses, as well as for families just getting off the ground. We think there's still a lot of ground to be broken. Bank, where business banks, manufacturers bank. Want a job? Sure, I got a job. Want to know why? Famous grilled chicken breast sandwich. Gonna be the biggest thing since the cheeseburger, they tell me. I got a brother-in-law makes a million bucks selling fried chicken. That's not good enough for heart. No, sir. We gotta grill. So why bother? Because the customer will go someplace else. That's why I bother. You know what that's called? Common sense? Democracy. This is America. I'm the boss, and that's a grilled chicken sandwich. You're hired, kid. The Audi three-year test drive. Three years of German style without the responsibilities of ownership. Three years of German luxury with none of the scheduled maintenance costs. Three eminently affordable years with the car you've always desired. Don't let a lease this impressive pass you by. 
For more information, call 1-800-727-4800. Well before sunrise on Thursday, the Benson Ford had again negotiated the Sioux locks, this time downbound, without hitch or delay. Underway in the St. Mary's River, she was joined by a small boat with a load of groceries and supplies. Despite the hour, the deckhands and watchmen were there to carry the boxes into the galley. Harry Castle says with the men working together, sometimes for months without a day off, tempers can flare. Oh, you sound off at each other, you know, take a walk and a few other things. And in a couple hours, it's all over. You're all back together. You, when you're off the boat, you can't wait to see that guy again. And what about fights? Well, there have been a few. I mean, the officers are not supposed to know about anything like that. They don't put up with anything like that. You, No matter whose fault it is, you're both gone. By 7.30, it was time for breakfast, but one man on board would not make it back to the galley this morning. Yeah, what do you got for breakfast? A heavy fog was quickly filling the river, and hey, Captain uh, Owens would have to stay yeah, in the wheelhouse. Okay, how about a uh, rye sandwich with that, uh, give me a ham, eh? All right, thanks. Fog so thick that even a spotlight fails to penetrate it made navigation in the river treacherous. Word came quickly that traffic would have to stop. While third mate Barry Van took his position at the rear of the boat, Captain Owens checked the location in the river where he would drop the stern anchor, and a few minutes later gave the word to let it go. secured with both the stern and the bow anchors, it was simply a matter of waiting until the fog lifted. But for the deckhands, the time would be spent working. I just got married last year. That's another reason why it's rough out here. Once you get connected with somebody, uh, you miss them a lot. It's not like just, just yourself. Now you got somebody else to think about and you're not there with them. That's kind of rough. While the Benson waited, the Arthur Anderson, the boat closest to the Fitzgerald when she sank, made a ghostly pass looking for a spot to anchor. It took another 40 minutes for the fog to lift, but with some editing magic in just a few seconds, we'll show you how it finally disappeared. As you'll see, both the Anderson and another downbound freighter behind the Benson were also waiting at anchor. Okay, Captain, we're ready to take her up. Hello. 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 It took several minutes to get the anchor up, but once she was free, the Benson again was headed south. For a while, through the twists and turns of the St. Mary's River, Captain Owens remained at the helm. But at Rock Cut, a man-made channel carved by the Army Corps of Engineers back in the 1920s, he turned the boat over to the third mate, Barry Van. For six years after high school, Barry built and raced sailboats, and then spent his next three years at the Great Lakes Maritime Academy in Traverse City, Michigan. At this academy, you learn your basics, how to navigate, your rules of the road, mostly the paperwork. When you really start to learn is when you get out here and uh, sail with different captains and different officers. You can go through the academy, but it's a lot different from that classroom to out here on the deck. You take your, your cadets now, they get all their training in the summertime. Well, then their first job, they're up there in Duluth, and it's 25 below zero, and the harbor's full of ice, and they haven't prepared them. In the lakes, an electronic autopilot usually keeps the Benson on course and makes the wheelsman's job easier. But in the rivers, he earns his pay either by keeping the steering pole on the bow pointed at a target ahead on the river, or by following commands from the captain or mate, according to the gyro gauge in the wheelhouse. Sometimes he'll give you the rudder command, 20 left or 20 right, or 10 left, 10 right. And if he doesn't, he just, with your own judgment, 
bring the boat around with the right amount of rudder, depending how fast or slow you want it to come. Early in the afternoon, the Burns Harbor, another thousand footer, approached the Benson upbound. Because these remarkable vessels carry three times the load of a conventional freighter, yet employ the same size crew, they're a major factor in the declining number of boats and men at work in Great Lakes shipping. The other dominant factor, of course, was the collapse of the steel industry in the early 1980s, when a number of U.S. companies went bankrupt and closed mills. And even though there's been a strong resurgence in steel over the past few years, its future seems no more certain than the weather these boats will face late in the season. Where I live, just about everybody from the town sailed one time or another. They, you know, they're, uh, I bet you of a town of uh, 2,000 people, they had 500 sailors. Conveyor man Pat Fields comes from Lance in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. He's worked as a deckhand, watchman, and wheelsman, and like none of those jobs. But he's found his niche as a conveyor man. My duties are to uh, uh, unload the boat and keep and maintain the maintenance on all of the boom and the, the, the gates and the tunnel. Every 50 hours, the whole system has to be completely greased. That's the, all through the tunnel and all through the loop and the boom, which consists of 2,500 grease feedings. So what does Pat like about the job? The money and the time off. I, I'm so spoiled. I only work seven months a year. And I'm home like this year. You know, I'm going home the, the 18th of October, and I won't have to come back until the 20th of March, hopefully. As the Benson steamed south in Lake Huron once again, the captain called a lifeboat drill, and all hands were soon on deck to practice a routine that could mean life or death. While none of these men lack a healthy respect for the weather and the threat it can pose, all of them seem to have faith in their captain as well. Most of the captains out here realize the danger of, of the storms, and uh, when they can, you know, they'll, they'll take the precaution, take the necessary precautions to not to put the crew in jeopardy or, or the boat. Barry Van, like the other mates, wheelsmen, and certain other crew members, works a four-hour watch, is off for eight hours, and then back on again for four. It's a schedule designed to keep all the boat's vital jobs manned 24 hours a day. In his time off watch, Barry refinishes furniture and does much of his sanding right on deck. What to do with time off on board is a problem that each man solves for himself. I work uh, 8 to 12 watch, which is 8 to 12 in the morning and 8 to 12 at night. In between, after my nap, you usually have to get a quick nap in there in between your watches. I like to read. I do a lot of reading. What is the best, gentlemen? As usual, there was a poker game going on this evening in the crew lounge as the Benson Ford headed into another night on Lake Huron. Until recently, Pat Fields had been a regular at the poker table. Well, I've been playing poker, but they've been beating me so bad that I, I kind of switched to watching TV and reading again. Pat has a wife and five sons, and the quiet times prompt thoughts of home. If I could find something halfway decent on, on shore where I could be home with my family, I would surely I would quit and, and, and do something else because it's, it's a terrible life for a married person. You know, you're like a stranger in your own home. When we decided to adopt, they told us it could be months, even years. Well, four days later, we got the call. Mm. We had to get a nursery together in no time. Crib, diapers, formula. He called the Citibank 800 number to ask for more credit on his Citibank MasterCard. He was a good customer, so I got him the increase immediately. I was glad Citibank could help when I needed them. All of us were. Mm -hmm. Not just MasterCard, Citibank MasterCard. I am Michigan. Come and see the beauty of my land and the sparkle of my water.
starts a two-game TV series against the scorching hot bats of the Milwaukee Brewers. The Tigers play the Brewers Saturday only on Channel 4. We know quality and productivity are important to our future. What we produce here makes the economy stronger and provides good jobs. But some corporations are putting short-term profits ahead of long-term strength. Moving jobs overseas, mergers and takeovers that are unproductive, they don't help build America. Investing in training and top-notch facilities, that's good for all of us. Let's turn it around. We need to put America's future first. Dawn on Friday painted the sky over the Blue Water Bridge between Sarnia, Ontario and Port Huron, Michigan, where the southern end of Lake Huron flows into the St. Clair River. The Canadian shore is lined with the chemical plants and oil refineries that gave this area the name Chemical Valley. In the old days, large tankers carried crude oil down from the north to the refineries here in Sarnia. But today, a pipeline does the job, and the boats are gone. 30 years ago, there was a big turnover in these boats. I mean, people didn't stay like they do now. The deckhands, they were coming and going, you know, suitcase parade, used to call it. You don't see that anymore out here. We're aging now. Everything's aging. We're all getting old. Uh, the boats are getting old. Uh, the, the crews are old. The average age on this boat alone is 50. At St. Clair, the Benson Ford steam past Captain Jim's gallery, where marine artist Jim Clary presides. So how many can they send you? Oh, probably all together, about two or three hundred. The public's <laughs> enormous fascination with life on the lakes has helped Clary and a handful of other artists turn their nautical themes into a thriving cottage industry. Clary's work ranges from his pen and ink series of lake freighters to his dramatic oils of tragic storm scenes. There are people who just love any kind of a ship in the water. I mean, you could see 100 vessels pass, but the 101st one you're going to still look at because it has a certain way in the water. My dock! There's a dedicated sect of people out there that do nothing but watch ships, and they have their favorites, and they, they yearn for a whistle from the captain. <laughs> They study them, they know everything, they know more about them than I do, you know. What's new? What's new? Yeah, hey, I'm getting off in about another two weeks. How much for your gore? The captain's fleeting conversations with friends as he passed his hometown of Marine City underscore the isolation of life on board. You feel disconnected, especially when I get off in the winter. I have to start making contact with all the friends I haven't seen all year. You just lose contact totally. Be in a way. Be in a way drives you crazy if you let it. <laughs> With the Benson in Lake St. Clair, Captain Owens had time for a quiet lunch. Up until uh, the later 50s, the captain carried his own cook. And the cook cooked what the captain liked to eat. There was only one item cooked. If the captain liked fried eggs with the eyes knocked out of them, everybody had fried eggs with the eyes knocked out of them. One thing that hasn't changed is the absence of women. Working on the lakes has always been a male preserve and remains so today. Crew members get 10 days off for every month they work, but each man arranges his own schedule and some work straight through seven days a week from March to November. During the three month winter layup, several of the men do maintenance work on the Benson, but others like Harry Castle don't go near the boat. Well, this year I'm gonna be working a lot on my house. I have a lot of painting and fixing up and stuff like that. So, with another round trip nearing completion and its hull filled with taconite, the Benson Ford plowed through the Detroit River. Before this 1988 season would end, more than 60 U.S. boats would carry 68 million tons of iron ore. It would be the best year for shipping since 1982, but still a far cry from a pre-recession year like 1979, when vessels moved 103 million tons. Just below the Ambassador Bridge, the Benson was met, as usual, by the Westcott for a delivery of mail and fresh laundry. A few minutes later, the huge boat wheeled to its right and headed back up the Rouge. Because of its heavier load and lower draft, the boat actually dragged the bottom in places. Now, oh, there's some spots where we'll have two, three feet of water underneath the keel. But we'll go through Jefferson Street Bridge, and the dredge does not dredge in the bridges at all, on account of the cables. So it's just the vessels plowing their way through that dredge through the bridge. 
Finally, back at the Rouge dock, the self-unloading process started almost immediately with a powerful conveyor system at the base of the boat's hold, moving the taconite pellets up and then out the length of the huge boom. New mounds of iron ore soon were being formed on shore, ready to feed the insatiable blast furnace at Rouge Steel. It wasn't long ago that Ford was close to selling its steel division, suffering like other U.S. steelmakers from foreign competition, a strong dollar, and slack demand. Then, starting in the early 1980s, the UAW agreed to wage and benefit reductions, and the company spent a half billion dollars on high-tech renovations. These moves, combined with new limits on imports and a weakened dollar, have fueled a resurgence at Rouge Steel. But for how long, no one seems to know. In the meantime, the steel is used to make the new Ford Mustang in the same Rouge assembly plant where those sub-chasing Eagle boats were built more than 70 years ago. Captain Pat Owens was heading off for a two-week stay at home. Oh, I enjoy being home, but then I enjoy the work. Day. I have to work someplace, and uh, I think I made the right choice. Earlier this year, just before the start of the new shipping season, the Ford Motor Company sold its three ore carriers, including the Benson Ford. Sold them to the Lake Shipping Company of Cleveland. It was just too risky, according to Ford, to rely on its own boats for all the raw materials in its steel-making operations. So now those needs will be met by the Lake Shipping Company. Many of the men on the Benson will continue to work on board under the new owners, but the names of the boats have been changed, and their sail clearly marks the end of an era at the Rouge. We may never again see the likes of old Henry Ford's remarkable self-contained manufacturing complex. I'm Mort Krim. Good evening. Risky Business, Iron Boat, Iron Men has been brought to you by the Michigan Travel Bureau. Celebrate the Great Lakes. By Manufacturers Bank, Bank where business banks. And by Citibank, MasterCard and Visa. Extraordinary events. And now, modern photographic.